Hello and welcome to this special Hasselblad webinar in association with WEX Photo Video. I'm Mark Whitney, part of Hasselblad's European marketing team, and today I will be joined by my colleague Chris Coos, who is Hasselblad's Global Technical Communications Manager. Chris will be taking us through the Hasselblad X1D2 and 907X camera products, detailing the main technical specifications and comparing the differences between each of the systems. It's a common question we receive actually from photographers as to the differences between the two cameras and which camera would suit them best. Fundamentally, they're the same camera, i.e. they've got the same sensor, the same electronic platform and use the same XED lenses. So how do the cameras differ and which versions would suit you best as a photographer? Hopefully the webinar will cover everything you would like to know about the cameras, but if not, this webinar is also an opportunity to ask any questions. So please use the YouTube comments uh, panel onto the side of the screen uh, to ask any questions. Uh, we're also joined by a representative from WEX behind the scenes who can also help to answer any questions relating to Hasselblad or WEX. So please use the same comments box. So Chris, hi, how are you? Hi Mark, yeah, good, thank you. Ready to go. Okay. Uh, so just got a few screens to go through before Chris gets on with the main presentation. Uh, so just a little shout out for the Hasselbad Masters. Uh, our competition is currently open until the end of July. Uh, so if you're interested in entering that, please head over to the Hasselbad website and enter your submissions. We look forward to seeing them. And then a quick agenda for today's webinar. So we've got an introduction to the X1D2 and 907X camera. Um, Chris will be going through the common functionalities and features that they share. Uh, and then the next part will be to then look at the differences between the two systems. And then finally, we'll finish up uh, with um, what criteria maybe suggests which camera system is best for you and the style of your work. Uh, so we estimate this to be around 50 minutes, uh, which should hopefully leave us some time at the end for the Q&A. So as I say, any questions, uh, please enter them into the YouTube uh, comments box and we'll look to pick them up where we've got time. So Chris, if I stop sharing and you can share your screen. Certainly, thanks very much, Mark. So just before we start, Chris, um, so fundamentally the same cameras, uh, the X1D and the 907X sharing yep. the same sensor. So you'll be going through um, all the different elements that they share and generally the specification of each camera. Yeah, so basically we look at, as you just said, the, the five or six, uh, features and benefits, if you like, that they share from the platform, etc. Uh, and then we'll move on to look at the, the, if you like, the subtle differences in terms of handling, functions, features, and so on. And depending on what type of shooting you do, uh, each of those differences, if you like, will probably guide you to which camera is best for you. Um, so if, if we make a start now, uh, so common functions and features, I suppose we've got to start at the heart of the camera. So the standard 50 megapixel sensor uh, that pretty much everybody's using in the cameras these days. Uh, so we take that and as Hasselblad, we will then calibrate that sensor. So this is exactly the same whether your X1D or the 907, uh, they go through exactly the same treatment in terms of sensor calibration. Uh, we look in terms of even though the 907, if you like, has a two part body. So you have the digital back and the 907 camera body that come together. It still goes through exactly the same treatment in terms of making sure the sensor is parallel to the optical plane. Obviously, that dovetails into Hasselblad's natural color solution, uh, which, as you know, basically means we get that Hasselblad look and feel to the images very high resolution uh, and quality color, shall we say. One of the big things, well, for the whole Hasselblad system, not just the 907 and the X1D2, is the, the color, the look. And the uh, Hasselblad natural color solution uh, basically takes into account three main things that can adjust, if you like, everybody's perception of the uh, captured color. So we spent a lot of time and money basically honing in the look and feel of the Hasselblad uh, captured image. As a comparison, it's probably really neutral compared to other manufacturers, you know, in, in terms of saturation, contrast, sharpness or initial sharpness out of the camera. And Hasselblad's always gone for that. Let's get it technically correct. So a, a, a nice color 
perfect image to start with. And then you can always move away from that in terms of additional saturation, sharpness, and so on. But if you start from a known good position, then you know it's really there for people who want accurate color. And then you can apply all of your filters and plugins and so on. The whole point is it's a single uh, color profile solution within the Hasselblad's color workflow. So you don't even need to think about it. You can just capture your images uh, and then adjust your raw files to those, if you like, way out type colors at a later stage. Obviously, the way we process the data from the sensor and effectively get a 16-bit color definition within the Hasselblad color space means that you know we have a lot of control and a lot of uh, positioning of colors uh, to make sure you get that wide range of color capture, uh, even out to the extremes. I suppose one of the other big differences between ourselves and a lot of the other brands, shall we say, is we still use the central lens shutter. So we have a leaf shutter there and two reasons for that. Uh, the first primary one really would be for flash synchronization, but also in terms of vibration generation, the the lens shutter, because the movement is radial, there's very little uh, vibration that gets carried into the camera body. Uh, so we don't have a mechanical shutter in that camera body to cause vibration issues. The main reason for it really though is the uh, flash synchronization. So you can sync with flash all the way up to a 2,000th of a second if you wish, which just makes synchro sun type work simple very very easy and you don't need any additional you know high speed uh, flash triggers or anything like that you can just use your standard flash and away you go the other main feature that the cameras share is the touch interface now this particular interface has been designed to be very if you like touchscreen phone like interface so you have touch and scroll adjustment of the, the value, so shutter speed, aperture. So very, very quick access, quick adjustment. Obviously, if you're wearing thick gloves or so, and we do have control wheels and so on, and, and control wheels even on the 907 to adjust the values, but the touch screen is the quickest and easiest way. But it works just like a smartphone. So when you're previewing the image or when you're zooming into the live view, it's just double tap to go to 100%, or you've got pinch and zoom and you can swipe through pages and captured images. So basically, both cameras are designed around a very clean, simple layout. Uh, if there's a button or a dial, it's got a purpose. It's not there just to make it look retro. Both cameras share the two video options. Uh, so obviously, there's standard HD, and there's the new 2.7K option, 8-bit uh, color, finished video in camera, so you'll have an MP4 file basically saved to the SD card. Um, very simple. Uh, the cameras have got built-in microphones. There's a, obviously with the earphone, sorry, headphone socket, you can monitor the sound and listen to the playback. Um, so very quick and easy video functionality. Uh, due to the sensor, there's a single capture speed. So we're running at sort of 29 frames per second. Uh, so unfortunately, there's no slow-mo functionality and so on, but it's a good high quality standard video uh, capture device. Obviously, the great sensor and camera body is fantastic, but it's only as good as the glass that's in front of it. And so at the end of the day, the XED lens family was designed specifically for the uh, 44 by 33 sensor that we have within the X1D and the 907X. So we don't have any wasted uh, image circle area. Everything is designed specifically for these cameras. So they're smaller and lighter than our previous camera range, the H system. So the, you, the benefit there is two or three lenses in your bag you don't really notice. We've expanded the range to 10 lenses at the moment. So you've got everything from your wide angle lenses up to telephoto, if I move to the next slide, it gives us a more of a visual look at what's available. Obviously, we're always expanding this range, but this is the current uh, array of lenses that we have. Just to give a, a, a comparison, 
So our 21 mil is the equivalent in terms of field of view to a 17 millimeter for a, a, a full frame DSLR sensor. So you can see there, nice and wide, all the way up to a sort of uh, a medium telephoto equivalent. Uh, and there's one zoom as well for those. So that's a, sort of a standard zoom sits there. So something for everybody really there. Uh, the 80 1.9 obviously is great for portraits. Uh, the 90, still pretty good fast aperture. Uh, the 120 is a macro lens, which will give you a, a one to two uh, magnification. magnification. Now, obviously, this can be expanded. We have uh, adapters which let you use various other lenses on both of these cameras. So if I start off with our, our basic XH adapter, this means you can take one of our H system lenses, and there's 12 of those covering again from a 24 mil all the way up to a 300 mil. And you can attach that lens to either of the bodies. And depending on how old the lens is, the, the lens will autofocus. You can use the shutter in the lens, no problem at all. For very, very old H lenses, uh, autofocus won't be available. You'll have to manual focus, but that's not too bad. You have focus peaking, etc. But you can still use the shutter in the lens and synchronize with flash up to its maximum speed. The issue with the XH adapter is that uh, because it's effectively a spacer, the focal length uh, and the, the, the actual lens itself is designed to cover a 645 film format. So you're actually taking a, a section out of that image circle. So there's a little bit of a crop factor applied there. To get around that, uh, we have the XH converter 0.8. This has an optical train inside and effectively you get a 0.8 reduction in the uh, focal length of the attached lens. You get two thirds of a stop aperture improvement. And the whole point is that you get very similar angle of view to when that lens was used on a 100 megapixel sensor H6D. So if you had it 24 mil super wide angle, like a 16 or 17 mil, when you use the 0.8 converter, you'll get exactly the same field of view, nice wide angle view, even you know you're using the X1D2 or the 907X. So to summarize that, if this was my uh, H system capture using the 100 mil lens uh, with the large sensor, if I was to use the basic XH adapter, I would take a portion of the image circle and I'd get a cropped view. So effectively, it would look like I was using a longer lens. With the 0.8 converter, I actually keep the same field of view. And actually, I get a slightly wider aperture if I want it as well. As a comparison, here on the left are the H lenses and their focal lengths. And then you have the two different converters there. So with the adapter, the basic adapter, you can see the focal length is slightly in increased. But with the uh, 0.8 converter, I actually get the equivalent focal length there, a slightly wider uh, focal length. Depends what you want from the H lens you're attaching. But both of these adapters are good to actually use existing glass onto the new cameras. So we also have the XV adapter for those customers that are using or still have their, their uh, V system cameras, say a 500C or something like that, and have a few of the Zeiss lenses. Basically, you can attach those lenses to either camera. Manual focus and aperture, obviously, as the lenses were, but you will have to use the electronic shutter uh, in the camera body, obviously, because we can't use the built-in shutter. Um, but it means you've got access to all of these lenses as well. Again, from you know very wide angle all the way up to sort of 300 plus millimeter uh, telephoto lenses. Additionally, then we have the X-Pan adapter. So early 2000s, Hasselblad uh, sold the X-Pan and X-Pan 2 cameras, and they had three lenses. 
the 30 to 45 to 90. Uh, these were manual focus, manual aperture. And so again, with this basic adapter, these tiny lenses can be used on either of the camera bodies. Manual focus, and again, you'll have to use the electronic shutter on the camera bodies. But at least, you know, this is very, very compact. Uh, the 45 mil that we, we're seeing here, that's very similar in size to the uh, XCD 45P, the compact lens that we have. And then there's third party. Uh, there are a few third party manufacturers now that make different adapters to fit the uh, XCD lens mount. Uh, you know, that could be photo deox and so on. Many, many ones that allow you to use, should we say medium format lenses, Zeiss, uh, you know, the, the Otis lenses that have a nice wide image circle, uh, and Canon, Nikon, uh, Leica lenses. So many adapters that allow you to then use those lenses onto either of these camera bodies. And again, manual focus, plus uh, electronic shutter within the camera body. So that's the main central points that are the same for both cameras. So gonna move on to the, the differences. Uh, the first main one really that people run into is the, the viewfinder systems on offer. So if you look here, you can see the optical viewfinder, which is an, an accessory. Basically, it just mounts into the top of the 907 body. And you have bright line frames inside that for the 21 mil, the 30 mil and the 45 mil lens. Now, obviously, if you've got longer lenses than that, uh, it's going to be an estimation. Um, and also, if you're trying to focus more closely, your issue there is that the optical finder and the actual camera are going to see slightly different fields of view as you get closer. So we're talking here within two meters or so, there'll be a slight difference. You just need to bear that in mind. But this is great basically for um, if your subject's relatively static, uh, whether it's a, a person, obviously if you're shooting landscapes, it's fantastic. You can tripod mount it, you can pre-focus manually, uh, and if it's very, very close, you can just use a slightly uh, wider field of view. Uh, but that way, you know, using the remote trigger, you can then basically uh, don't have to look through the camera or just basically use the uh, optical finder to line things up, get things ready, and then you're just ready to shoot whenever you need it. So if we compare that to X1D, obviously there's the... Uh, EVF, which most people use. If you're moving up from a DSLR or a mirrorless camera, you'll be 99% happy using an EVF. And that will be the natural way, basically bringing a camera to your eye to, to take an image. Benefit is it's 100% viewfinder, so what you see is what you get. Makes life very simple for moving the autofocus point around onto the place you need it. And obviously if you're shooting portraits with maybe the 80 millimeter 1.9 or one of the longer 135 lenses or so on that autofocus point placement is is quite critical for ensuring that the main area of the image you want sharp is actually the point the camera is focusing on if we then do a rear screen comparison versus the evf 907 wise the tilting interface means, the tilting screen, sorry, means that you've got options for how you use the camera. It sits very comfortably for a waist level finder type uh, usage. So just like the uh, V system cameras where you would mostly shoot from a waist level point of view, you can bring that uh, display up to 90 degrees. You can access the main points for autofocus and so on, you can select your point onto the subject and then hold the camera waist level to shoot. It has a 45 degree option as well. So if you want to shoot for more of a sort of shoulder level, you can, and obviously the camera uh, screen will go flat against the back of the camera, but holding the camera eye level like that for a long time is quite, uh, especially if you have to take it away to see the screen, can be quite a, a, a chore on your shoulders. Depends what you're shooting as to what you need. Also, very, very bright sunlight 
if it's directly overhead and you, you're not casting a shadow, can make seeing the screen uh, and judging you know, composition and exposure a little bit more difficult. You can make yourself a, 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 a shade or a blind, but it's just something to bear in mind. Using the EVF just makes life that little bit easier. Uh, you can see exactly what you're going to get. Pretty easy to use in any type of lighting. If it's really, really bright, you can even access the menus and so on within the EVF and make your selections there. So depends what type of shooting you're trying to do as to which screen's going to work for you. Uh, generally, the X1D with the EVF and the rear screen means you've got the best of both worlds. Control systems. The 907 as a default camera body, so the digital back plus the 907 attached to that, basically has a control dial here and an option button on the side of the camera. Obviously, the main knob there is, is the shutter button. By default, these two uh, controls allow you to change the aperture and shutter. But if you want to change any of the other setting or ISO and so on, you'll need to go onto the rear display to access that. X1D with the additional buttons and dials, this means you can very quickly adjust aperture, shutter using the touchscreen on the back while you're looking through the EVF it means you can move the AF point around very, very simply. So it's just a little bit quicker to access those functions, even with the you know autofocus lock, uh, autofocus, manual focus, ISO, very quick and easy via the viewfinder to change those settings. Just a bit quicker than accessing uh, the functionality through the 907X. However, if you add the control grip to the 907X, almost all functionality from the X1D2 is automatically applied here. So as you can see, you've got the main buttons here for uh, focus choice, uh, autofocus, button, uh, you've got the preview button, menu button, you've got the joystick to move the AF points around, and you have two, although you can't see it, you have two uh, thumb wheels to access aperture and shutter. So pretty much all of the functionality that would be on X1D body is applied here, plus an additional shutter button. Flash shooting. Now the X1D has a Nikon compatible hot shoe, which makes life very easy. So it's TTL uh, functionality available. Uh, we don't support groups, but basic TTL is there. This means if you've got a, a, a remote trigger or even a, a hot shoe flash to go in there, it will work very, very nicely, very, very simply. If required, if you had a, a studio flash and you actually wanted to uh, connect it via a cable, you can do that. You can put an adapter into the uh, microphone socket, which will then tr uh, work as a, as a flash trigger socket as, uh, as well. Now, the 907X and the CFE50C, uh, there's no specific X-Sync socket or hot shoe on the camera body and back. No TTL. However, you can trigger your flash with a cable. So a 3.5 mil uh, adapter can plug into the out socket on the digital back, which will then add, act as a trigger. Uh, if I have uh, a radio trigger, all I need to do is plug that cable into the radio trigger, which will then trigger my flash units. Or if I've just got a standard long flash lead, again, we can come out of that out socket and plug directly into the flash unit to trigger it. If you're uh, lucky enough to have the optical uh, viewfinder, it's a two-part section, so I can remove the viewfinder section and I could mount my trigger in there and then just attach the cable directly above the camera straight into the trigger there. Otherwise, there are some third-party brackets available, uh, depending on, on how often you're going to shoot with the flash depends on how much you'll go into it, whether you'll need a bracket or not. 
The big difference in terms of 907X uh, and the CFE 250C is we can separate the two parts. So we can remove the camera connection part and we were left with the digital back. Now that means automatically I can connect to pretty much every uh, V system camera from 1957. Literally all you do would, for most of these would be connect the digital back and you would tell the back which camera you're connected to, 500C or so, whatever, which changes the triggering timing. Uh, and away you go. The camera body would then function as normal using the, the, the shutter in the lens, manual focus, manual aperture, and the back just works as a, as a digital film back uh, and will trigger every time. So beyond the V system, you can attach the digital back to obviously the arc body or various technical cameras. So it could be a field camera like this, or could be something as, as big and bulky uh, as, as a full size technical camera, maybe like a, a Linhoff Techno, that type of thing. Um, so very versatile. And again, triggering is basically from the flash sync socket on whatever lens you're using, maybe a copal shutter, something like that, into the digital back for triggering. Now the X1D cameras can do this as well. Uh, the actual adapter is just a basic plate to attach to one of your technical cameras. The exposure triggering is via the microphone socket. The only uh, slight difference between the uh, adaptability of both cameras would be effectively the distance from the sensor to the front of the digital back or camera body in this case. The X1D has a slightly deeper uh, recess for the sensor to the plate surface. And if I just go back one slide, you can see the sensor is very close to the front of the body here very little uh, depth. So if you are using things like ultra wides and lots of movements on a technical camera, then the V system back is probably better for you than an X1D body, but both can do it. Now body style, X1D is designed, you know, handheld, has a very, very uh, comfortable grip. You can use it eye level very, very easily. EVF makes life very simple to access most of the functionality on the camera very quickly. The 907X CFE 250C is designed for more of a waist level, a classic V system style operation. And as such, the body is built and shaped for you to be holding it almost at a waist level. So with that in mind, we can say the 907X is more uh, lends itself to a tripod type situation or a waist level shooting uh, situation. So landscape, architectural, copy stand work. You know, this is where the, the tilt screen, uh, when the camera's copy stand mounted, you can tilt the screen up and you'll be able to see the, the live view to make sure composition is correct. Low level shooting, very, very easy to accomplish. If we now look at X1D, this is really designed for faster moving situations where you need to keep tight control over the AF point, uh, depth of field control and so on. EVF makes that much simpler to achieve in a, in a quicker way. Low level shooting is possible, but to do that, you would then need probably uh, Focus Mobile 2, something like that, so you could get live view on a phone or an iPad to be able to see exactly what the camera's seeing from a very low level, but it is possible. And I think from my point of view, that's the main points, Mark, and then you've got some continuous, continue on slides from there. So if I stop sharing. Yeah, uh, just before we, we go to sort of, we're gonna summarize it and um, and sort of point out some of the, the factors that would determine which camera is best for you as a photographer. Um, but just got a few questions. Sure. Um, so uh, Kevin is joining us from California. So welcome, Kevin. Um, he's, um, I've just seen his latest comment, he's got the 907X, so okay. uh, thank you very much for that. Um, he's asking about spaces for close up work with regard to our lens range. So we've got the 120 as a macro, haven't we? We have, yeah. 
now, currently, there are no extension tubes within the XED lens range, uh, but there are some third party uh, options out there. Uh, one that I definitely know is the Photo Deox of uh, a 20 and a 48 mil extension tube, which will effectively just extend that space. Uh, it's a complete pass through, so all of the uh, control signals work, all of that works. Uh, I believe there are others as well, uh, third party offerings, but effectively uh, those ones I've seen and the reviews have been pretty good. So, uh, but unfortunately at this point, Hasblad does not have an extension tube for an XCD lens. Okay. Um, and then we've got uh, John and he's mentioning that, um, so I think, I'm not sure if you mentioned it during your summary, but the cameras both offer electronic shutter. Yep. So mechanically for the lens shutter, it's 2,000 for the second. Yep. But with um, electronic shutter, you can go up to 10,000 for the second. You can. Yep. Um, but the disadvantage of that is using flash. Yes. Um, so you can't currently use flash with electronic shutter. Uh, is that due to change or not? Or is it some sort of physical limitation? No, basically the sensor itself, uh, the readout time, from top to bottom is around 300 milliseconds. So the problem is that if you're using a, a, a flash, basically we could trigger the flash at the start of the exposure and the first line of the electronic shutter readout would get all the flash and the rest would be black basically. Um, so the, there is uh, a workaround if you like, but it only is only useful for a static subject almost in a studio environment. Now, most people I've spoken to want to try and capture moving subjects and use the, the flash as a, a, to freeze the motion, as it were. It's not possible to do that, but if you're talking about a studio or a static functionality, you, you can work around it by triggering the flash and setting the exposure time to one second. Okay, hopefully that helps you, John. And um, a question from Abdul, uh, he's got the XED135 and he now wants to get the teleconverter uh, for it. Um, so yeah, I don't, I, I don't think we currently sell that separately, so. No, at the moment, uh, basically we have two, two um, different SKUs, if you like. We have the 135 as a standalone and the 135 with the 1.7. And from all of my sales part, there's no option at the moment for a 1.7 converter on its own. Okay, so I guess, uh, Abdul, if you speak to Wex and, um, you know, with regards to sales and we can see what options there are there as yep. a possible way around that. Yep. Okay, Chris, that's that's it for the questions. Um, please continue to get your questions in. Um, we've still got some time left uh, during the webinar to, to be able to answer those. And it'll be just good to know of the people watching today, you know, what is your preferred camera out of the two? And just to get a bit of audience uh, feedback, that'll be good to know. Okay. So if I can look to share my screen again. It should be able to. Okay, so we just try to summarize um, what factors would determine uh, which of the two cameras would suit you as a photographer best. Um, so if we start with the X1D2, um, the first point we've got there is if you're new to Hasselblad. Um, so it's our sort of entry level default. Uh, Chris, could you elaborate on that a little bit? Yeah, this is the easiest transition. Uh, so in terms of, you know, the size, weight, et cetera, moving up from a, a DSLR or even a, a mirrorless full frame, this is the simplest transition. You know, everything works in the way you're expecting. You're putting your eye to the EVF generally to shoot. So this is the most comfortable upgrade. Uh, most of the functionality is exactly how you would expect it to be. Uh, in, in terms of, you know, touch screens uh, uh, for AF points and so on. Plus, you've got the hot shoe, so everything is really there. You can make an easy transition from you know, your, your mirrorless or your, your full-frame DSLR, and everything you've got is then probably going to work more than easily with your X1D2. Okay, and the first few points there are sort of around the, the same subject, really. So yeah, if yeah. you're coming from a, a DSLR or mirrorless, obviously the familiarity of the X1D will, will hopefully make that a, a smooth transition. And it's an all-in-one um, package you know conventional design you know it's if someone was to draw a camera that's sort of commonly how it looks <laughs> yeah. um and the ergonomic um okay so the next bit um we've got a preference for a viewfinder so obviously you mentioned in your your previous slides that um the x1d has the digital uh viewfinder 
So if you if your shooting style, if you like holding the camera to your eye and shooting that way, then the X1D would be the preferred choice, Chris? Yeah, I think so. If, if you're used to that uh, eye level shooting style, I mean, both cameras can fit around different styles, no problem. You know, if I was trying to do copy work, either camera uh, can connect to, you know, uh, an iPad or a remote computer. So very simple to... Uh, you know, convert both cameras to that. But if your preferred style is, you know, if I'm talking shoot uh, uh, street shooting here, then basically bringing in the camera to the eye, the shutters in the lenses are nice and quiet, click and away you go. Uh, if you're a regular user of flash, you know, the X1D makes that transition from previous system very simple. If you've got a Nikon flash gun, it will fit straight into the, to the hot shoe. Uh, you know, so that is the easiest transition. However, you know, the 907, if you're an existing V system owner, there's more bits and pieces that side that make that more preferable. Uh, depends on the way that you like to shoot, whether you've, you've shot from a waist level type situation before, again, V system or similar, then the 907 will feel much more uh, friendly to you in terms of that style. Okay, and you mentioned the the use of flash there, so that was our next point. That obviously you explained again um, that the X1D has a built-in hot shoe. Um, so if you're using flash, you can either put um, a flash gun on the top or a wireless trigger, and it holds it nicely. Um, whereas, uh, again, as you explained, the the V system isn't designed uh, to be quite that way with flash. Um, so again, if you're mainly a studio photographer that uses flash, then the X1D would uh, suit that better well if you're in contrast if you're a landscape photographer that doesn't use flash and you use ambient light out on location then that wouldn't be an issue for the 907x so again that could be another deciding factor um and then we've put a um sort of a, a suggested use for street photographers so it's nice and discreet could you explain a bit about that chris yeah again you know both of these bodies are are, are small in comparison to a lot of bigger professional cameras out there should we say um and considering their medium format you know it's a very very small camera body even with some of the you know the 45p lens onto that x1d it's a tiny camera combination and i think you can walk along bring the camera to your eye and it's not going to go you know we've we've been there mark out on the street with our old h system cameras uh immediately you bring that camera out bring it up to your eye people's like what's that because it's so different these very discreet it's simple to do things like street photography and so on uh, you know the camera doesn't get in the way now if we then look at the 907 i think again you can you can do that if you get the camera set up to shoot discreetly it can be done you can pre-focus set everything so you're literally just pointing the camera and click away you go that's very easy especially with the screen tilted at 45 degrees 90 degrees so you can see what's actually composition wise but it's a slightly different working workflow um, which we'll, we'll move on to now yep and then uh, just the last point we've got there on the x1d is the price um so basically body only for the two cameras, the X1D is, is slightly more cost effective. And um, even more so if you then in, add in the optical viewfinder and uh, control grip accessories for the 907X. So again, that could be another deciding factor um, if, uh, if budget was uh, sort of limited. Um, so the X1D would be a little bit favorable there as well. Uh, so then to go over to the 907X, um, so the, the big advantage here is the, if you're an existing owner of a Hasselblad V system camera, so you have the familiar, familiarity of shooting. So waist, um, waist level hand holding, uh, and also the compatibility with your older bodies. Yeah, very much so. So as we said in the presentation, it is pretty easy to attach the digital back here onto almost every V system camera, um, all you need to do on the digital back is, is select the, which type of camera body that you've attached it to. So it knows the timing from when it gets an exposure signal. Uh, and from that point onwards, all you need to set is your white balance and ISO. That's it. Uh, 
you would then use your V-System camera in exactly the same way that you've always used it, sitting, you know, aperture, shutter, manual focus, even using the, the, the focusing screen on the camera body to do your focusing and, and, and shooting. If you've got a motorized camera body, you know, the, the limitation is the camera body. How fast can it shoot, not the digital back? Okay. Uh, next point we've got there is the, the fashion <laughs> conscious photographers. And um, I think we've already had some love in the comments. Uh, Bro Rudd saying how, how much of a beautiful camera the 907X is. And, um, you know, obviously photography aside, um, it is almost like a fashion accessory. You know, it's, it's pretty cool and trendy and retro good to be seen with maybe um yeah I mean, so. it's very close to our um v system swc combination you know the very small camera body and and film back as it was um so if you know you put one of the more wide angle lenses on this or even the 45p you've got a very very small combination there uh to to shoot very very similar styles to if to a v system swc mm. And I think, you know, the, the old 500 series camera is so iconic, yeah. um, you know, and any old period uh, TV drama, you know, they need a camera. It's always the, the 500 series that they go to as the prop. And, um, and obviously the, the 907X is the, the newer sort of digital version of that. So it's, it's sort of, it's already an icon, even though it's still relatively a new camera. So but obviously, the, the, you know, the digital back styling, is designed to match in with the the chrome styling on the v-system camera so that was part and parcel of the design process okay so that um if you're a conscious a fashion conscious photographer it could be the, the reason why you go for that and then uh, as we've already briefly spoke about so landscape photographers it's an ideal camera for for landscape chris yeah perfect for that you know top of the tripod you can mod, you know, tilt the screen so that it's easier to see prepare everything, you know, pre-focus, check the uh, composition on the rear view screen. And at, at that point, then you can literally plug in your remote release if you need to and just trigger the camera without even looking at it. Okay. And another point we got there is portrait photographers. So um, one of the features that people used to like about the old sort of waist level V system camera with the waist level viewfinders is that if they're a portrait photographer, they get to maintain eye contact with their subjects and they're you know, almost bringing the camera up to an eye is sort of like a barrier between yeah. and, and sort of um, and getting that sort of relationship and uh, sort of emotion from your subject. Um, so, yeah, because it's the same style, it would have that same benefit if that was something that was. Of yeah. And I think also, you know, I, I've seen many photographers work in a uh, literally they don't, don't even look through the camera. So the camera is tripod mounted. They've got everything set up. You know, they're shooting at a, 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 an F8 or F11 aperture to get depth of field. So we're not talking shallow uh, depth of field type shots here. We're talking, you know, a decent depth of field. They pre-focus on the subject area and literally, you know, the subject comes in, everything's preset and they can just remote release talking to the subject. So they don't even need to worry about have I got critical focus on the on the leading eye and so on because the depth of field will take care of that so again different types of shooting both cameras can be modified to or set up to work for you okay then the last point we've got there is again as you'd already explained but the, the use of technical cameras so whilst uh, both cameras do work on technical cameras there's adapters and ways of doing it for both um, it's slightly more flexible and easier on the 907x and um I think as you explained, it's mainly because uh, because the back comes off, it's nice and easy just to clip on. Yep, yep. And then also the sensor is a lot closer to the optics. Yes, very much so. And, you know, if you're uh, the type of work that you do means you need large uh, shifts of the image. Uh, so, you know, you're, you're actually you know shifting your lens up by a considerable amount. Although it's not a massive difference, the uh, 907X, well, the CFE, uh, 250c back basically allows you to get more uh, more shift before vignetting becomes a problem uh, so it depends on the type of work you do uh, which of those cameras would be more suitable on a technical camera okay and then uh, also just to mention um, software wise uh, because again the both cameras are exactly the same in terms of their sensor electronics and uh, the platform um, they both produce exactly the same raw file. So any of the software options, so whether that's Hasselblad's own focus software 
or any of the third party support we have like Photoshop and Camera Raw and Lightroom, um, exactly no difference. And also both systems work with our Focus Mobile apps. Chris, could you explain a little bit more about that? Yeah, so obviously Focus Mobile 2, which is the, the latest version of the app uh, for these two particular cameras, you can use an iPad and you can shoot tethered or you can shoot through Wi-Fi. Now, if you shoot tethered, the raw file is automatically stored onto uh, the iPad itself and you can uh, edit, crop, color correct, whatever you want to do, and then process the image into uh, full-size JPEG if you wanted to, to then be able to then share that uh, automatically. If you've got Wi-Fi or you know 3G, 4G type connection, you can share the image straight away. Plus, any work that you do on the raw files, when you import them into your main um, desktop computer, the corrections that are stored inside would be available for the Focus desktop app to then be able to read. So you're not wasting your time making corrections that aren't available later. So it makes things very, very straightforward. Plus, you can uh, check composition, go into live view, choose your focus point and so on on the iPad. There's also an iPhone version of the app, but obviously that's more of a, a remote control app. Yes, you can download a single raw file, but obviously depending on the RAM in your in your phone, there's not much you can do in terms of editing. It's literally, I can process that raw into a JPEG and share it, but you need the iPad to access the actual main editing controls. Okay. Then I think uh, just to sum up um, with, just a couple of words, really. I think, um, you know, the differences between the two cameras, they, they basically provide options for photographers and uh, flexibility. So it really does come down to personal preference. It depends on who you are as a photographer, what you look for in a camera, what sort of style you shoot. And as I say, personal preferences as to what is important to you as a photographer. And hopefully what Hasselblad have done with these two systems is provide plenty of options um, to help suit those needs and requirements. And, um, you know, Hasselblad always very um, keen to, to try and get as much backwards compatibility as possible. So for example, with the adapters for older lenses. Yep. Um, so yeah, it's a case of weighing up the, the benefits and the options and, and which one suits you best. So I think that's pretty much uh, the way to sum it up. Okay, so that's pretty much the, the end of our, our the slides that we have prepared. Now, we have had a couple more um, questions come in, Chris. Okay, good. Um, so Abgul has asked another question, and um, you should be good at answering this one because I know Chris is uh, also uh, a keen astro uh, photographer, uh, include, uh, using the X1D as well. So you should be good to, uh, to, to, shoot, uh, to answer this. Uh, so Abdul's asking, is it possible to do time-lapse with the 907X? and he's uh, shooting the Milky Way. Um, so is there any tips or advice you can give there? Yeah, so you could use the intervalometer uh, built into the camera, uh, or obviously if you're, you're, you're tethered to a computer that you've got with you or iPad, you can do it that way. But uh, basically within the main camera body, uh, either of the two cameras can be used for this. But if you go into the intervalometer, you can set up uh, how many shots over uh, X amount of duration and time between the shots. So just look at the intervalometer uh, and that will do everything you need for that. Okay, uh, thank you very much. And then we've got another question from Phil Nenner and uh, John has already been kind enough to, to answer it for us in the comments, but just to answer it as part of the webinar as well. Uh, any adapters to get the CFV back on a four by five? Uh, yeah, so obviously, depending on which four by five you're trying to, to connect it to, generally each of the manufacturers have an adapter plate. And so you all you'll need is a V system compatible. Uh, the CFV back is a V system style back. That's why it fits onto the V cameras straight off. And so you will then need an adapter plate for a V system um, back and that will work straight away. Um, Obviously, depending on the shutter in use uh, on the on the camera, will depend on what cabling, etc., you need. But generally, if it's a like a copal shutter type scenario, you would have a single lead from the copal shutter coming in to the flash in socket on the digital back, and that's all you're going to need. 
Okay, great. So uh, thank you very much, Chris. I think that's pretty much all the, the questions um, answered. And then just to finish up, uh, any more uh, questions you have uh, that come to mind after the webinar or any more information on, on Hasselblad, obviously you can go to Hasselblad's own website at Hasselblad.com uh, and also WEX, of course, um, as a representative for, for Hasselblad in the UK, um, WEX would also be happy to help answer any questions. And so please head over to their website and ask um, their tech team. Uh, so thanks very much for joining us today. Uh, thanks to Chris. Okay. And um, we'll hopefully see you on another webinar again soon. Thank you very much.